Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about how liquidity pools are a really useful tool as DeFi infrastructure for uh, builders. Uh, before we dive into all of that exciting stuff, I want to start actually just by touching on something that's very important to all of us here. Uh, I think if there's one thing that we've learned in, in crypto over the last three months, it's the value of decentralization, transparency, immutability uh, in finance. Uh, with the billions of dollars that have been lost of consumer funds by exchange like FTX, lending platforms like BlockFi, Celsius, Voyager, um, the value proposition of DeFi is, has been validated now more than ever. Um, and the people in this room are the people who are really bringing this to fruition. So um, it's, we're not only here to kill, uh, build cool tech, we're actually building a safer, more fair, more transparent um, world for all users of financial products and services. And I think that the work that we're doing now, I think, has, has always been important. And I think it's more clear than ever like how much the world actually needs this. So with that said, um, I'm Jeremy Musigi. I'm CEO of Orb Collective. Uh, Orb Collective is a growth team for the Balancer DAO. Uh, our mission is to scale uh, global utilization of the Balancer protocol. and uh, support the resiliency and long-term sustainability of uh, Balancer as a community and as a technology. Balancer is DeFi liquidity infrastructure. And um, Balancer is designed as, an, as a very flexible AMM automated market maker that is highly customizable. So the liquidity pools within Balancer um, serve as this uh, building block, as this piece for developers that, are, that can um, you know, integrate and build on top of this base layer uh, for many different use cases. And we'll definitely dive into that. Um, Balancer serves today as one of the top uh, decentralized exchanges in DeFi across chains. Um, but Balancer really, and, and this is what Balancer is, I think, historically most well known for. It's, it's, it's our exchange. But Balancer is actually way more than that. So first, I want to just kind of lay some like foundational knowledge about what a liquidity pool is so that we're all on the same page. Uh, so a liquidity pool is, is like a stockpile of tokens that uh, belong to separate individuals or, or, or organizations that are held together in one smart contract. And these tokens are pooled together in order to generate some yield by uh, putting those tokens to work, utilizing them in some um, effective, um, efficient way, uh, and creating a liquid market using those tokens. So in the case of an AMM or automated market maker, uh, these tokens are pooled together in order to create um, an exchange uh, market between different pairs of tokens. So uh, you make it so that a buyer or seller can trade with a liquidity pool basically by um, providing asset A and getting asset B in return at a given price, and that, that price is determined by the liquidity pool algorithmically. So I'll go through a couple of examples of liquidity pools. So first example is a single asset pool. And uh, a great example of this is uh, a money market or, or like a borrow lend protocol, such as Compound in this case. So in a single asset pool, there are lenders that are lending uh, a token into the pool, and borrowers are borrowing that same token out of that pool. Lenders are uh, earning interest, borrowers are paying interest, and it's one pool that consists of one token that's being used by both sides of this market. In a dual asset liquidity pool, now you open up a different, com completely different kind of use case. So uh, if you look at Uniswap, for example, you have 
um, a pool with two tokens. Let's say it's ETH and DAI. And this pool is maintaining a balance between the two. And as a trader, you can um, buy ETH from this pool by selling it DAI in exchange, or you can, uh, or vice versa. And uh, having this pool containing two different tokens serves as having a, a liquid market uh, so that anyone who wants to trade between these two can do so at any time. And, and you're not, this is not like an order book, which happens in, in traditional financial markets, where in order for your trade to be fulfilled, another person on the other side needs to want to do the exact opposite of your trade at the same price. They want to buy what you're selling and they want to sell what you're buying. Here, uh, in an automated market maker like Uniswap or Balancer, uh, that you're trading against a liquidity pool, not, not another trader. Now let's talk about multi-asset liquidity pools. So this is a concept that um, was originated by Balancer, but um, one of the great examples of it in practice is the Curve 3 pool. And uh, this is a, so first of all, multi-asset liquidity pool is a, is a pool that holds more than two assets and provides multi-directional liquidity uh, between all of the assets that are held in the pool. Um, and in the Curve 3 pool, you have a liquidity pool that contains the top three stable coins, DAI, USDC, and USDT. And what purpose does this serve? It, it serves um, any trader who is holding uh, one of these stable coins or two and wants to exchange into a different one, there's a very liquid market for them to be able to do that very efficiently. Uh, on the right side of the screen here, we have the Balancer Boosted Ave USD Pool or BBA USD for short. And this serves a similar purpose to the Curve 3 pool in that uh, it's, a, it's a stable coin pool. If you have USDT, you can trade for USDC or DAI or any of those uh, tokens for each other. But if you look at the screen, you actually see that this pool contains six assets, not three. And the, and the reason is because this pool is actually, con it consists of three separate two token pools that are nested together into one pool. So you have a, uh, you have a pool for USDT, you have a pool for USDC, and you have a pool for DAI. And I'm going to go into this specific type of pool soon, but for now, I'll just mention that um, the goal of this pool and the reason why there are six assets instead of three is that these tokens are, are also at the same time earning a yield outside of Balancer for all of the liquidity providers while also serving as, as an exchange between stablecoins. So we'll, we'll go more into that. It's a really exciting product called Boosted Pools. All right, so what can you build on a liquidity pool? Like now, hopefully, you have some sense of what a, what a liquidity pool is if you didn't already. But now let's go into what can you actually build with this and, and how does this work as a, as a building block or infrastructural piece for DeFi developers? So the first example that we'll look at is Arrakis Finance. Arrakis Finance is built on Uniswap v3. And Arrakis, what it is, is um, it's, an app, it's an application that reduces the complexity of uh, liquidity provider or LP strategies on Uniswap v3 uh, by automating them. So if, if you're familiar with Uniswap v3, you'd know that from v2 to v3, one thing that, that really changed and was very innovative is, is that they um, offered this concept of concentrated liquidity, where as a liquidity provider in a, in a pool, you can uh, allocate capital to specific ranges that are trading between a token pair. And uh, that offers a lot of opportunity to like fine tune your strategies and, it's, and it really opens the door for like highly sophisticated players to use this technology and really like have a competitive advantage over unsophisticated players. But the problem then is of course that it's a lot more complex and it's a lot harder to use for your average retail investor who owns tokens and wants to uh, generate some yield on them. So Arrakis is a solution um, built on top of the Uniswap v3 liquidity pools to uh, make these vaults, uh, what they call vaults, 
um, which are pre-programmed strategies, easy to use for anyone. Another example is uh, Yearn. Um, so Yearn has a lot of different vaults as well. And these vaults, um, similarly but different to Curve, are uh, a way to automate uh, like yield farming strategies usually. So if you, each, each uh, Yearn vault is designed around a certain asset. You put the asset into the vault and then there's a strategy that's designed for that vault that will take that asset and, and use it in the most profitable investment strategy available in DeFi. And these are not exclusively built on Curve. You can see here on the screen that there's an Aave vault. There are actually a couple of balancer vaults, but there are a lot of Curve vaults. So um, this example right here is a um, using the, the Curve 3 pool that we were looking at previously. There's a vault that uses that pool, uses the uh, LP token of that pool to uh, invest into the most profitable strategies. What this, these vaults can do basically is they could use the LP token itself if there are investment strategies that are you know, useful there, or it can access the underlying liquidity uh, from those tokens and use that and sort of bring it back at the end of the day. So uh, another example here, which I think is the most exciting one, is Fjord Foundry, which is built on Balancer. Now, um, this, I think, goes to show sort of how Balancer is really in a different category compared to these other AMMs because of the types of liquidity pools that you can use and you can create on Balancer. So, Fjord uses a primitive uh, a pool type on Balancer called a liquidity bootstrapping pool. And they use this to create uh, the most popular platform for launching a token. You wanna, so when you, a project is uh, launching a new token into the market, uh, they can use Fjord to uh, conduct this sale in, the way that, in a way that is uh, very fair, uh, uses a... Um, like reverse Dutch auction style price discovery mechanism to find the right market price and to give all participants an equal chance to buy into the sale. Um, it also provides protection against uh, bots that sometimes can like buy up an entire sale before other people get a chance. Um, and also you can use Fjord to uh, conduct a sale that actually raises capital in more than one asset. So Let's say you're, you want you to, you're launching your token and you want to raise uh, a treasury that consists both of ETH and stable, for example. You could actually have both of those being accepted by the pool so that at the end of the day, um, you've, you've raised uh, capital in both. So uh, let me just talk a little bit about liquidity bootstrapping pools. The way that this works and the way that this is possible is that an LBP is a balancer liquidity pool that has the ability to change its weights um, over time while it's live. So if a pool starts where it's 80% ETH and 20% DAI, uh, it can actually change over time and get to a completely different percentage distribution, such as like 20% ETH, 80% DAI. If I had a lot of ETH that I wanted to sell, I could use a liquidity bootstrapping pool to do that. While the, sh the weights shift over time, it adjusts prices over time, and it incentivizes uh, traders to trade against that pool and basically to, to move it into the balance that I want it to eventually get to. OK. Um, actually, why not? Yeah, so you can see here on this graphic from Dune Analytics that uh, we've had 299 uh, LBPs on Balancer uh, so far. Uh, over 90,000 investors have, have participated in those. And um, yeah, they've, there's been a lot of money raised and there's been a lot of uh, volume uh, for those projects. Um, and Fjord is, is uh, an awesome place to do that. So uh, let's now dive into more of these pool types on Balancer um, with, of course, a lens toward um, understanding how these are useful 
for developers. So we kind of talked about how liquidity bootstrapping pool is uh, useful for Fjord. They actually built a whole product based on that pool. Um, but there are more. So first, the weighted pool. Um, this is kind of like one of the more basic foundational liquidity pools on Balancer. Um, these pools can hold anywhere between two and eight tokens. Uh, they have fixed weights. Uh, the creator of a pool, which anyone can create, can create one, can set those weights um, according to their specifications. 50-50, 80-20, 90-10, uh, pretty much anything in between. And these can also hold, um, as I said, up to eight assets. So uh, one example of, of something cool that I've seen someone build using this product is uh, there was a, a gaming project. And in their game, there were these uh, in-game assets that players would earn by playing the game. Now, what the developers of this game needed to do was they needed to convert, they, they needed a way for players to be able to convert between one asset and another um, while they're playing the game. So let's say you earn a certain amount of like a certain in-game asset, and once you reach a certain level, you actually can level up to this other asset. There's a liquidity pool on Balancer that's actually working behind the scenes in this game, uh, and those tokens are being traded in that way. So this weighted pool is sort of the enabling component um, of, of that functionality in the game. So a stable pool is another example. And this is a, a pool that holds two to five tokens that uses um, a stable swap uh, formula for tokens that contain um, exact or almost exact value. Um, so again, this could be DAI, USDC, US, USDT, but it also can be uh, like wrapped Bitcoin um, derivatives like WBTC, RENBTC, uh, SBTC, uh, and you can also you know, this could be staked ETH uh, derivatives as well. So the advantages of, of one of these pools is that uh, for traders, there are tighter spreads and lower uh, slippage. For liquidity providers, you earn a competitive yield with very little impermanent loss, uh, which comes as a result of the, the way the formula balances between tokens of the same value. Boosted pool is something that I was talking about earlier. So in a boosted pool, what you have is, is a highly capital efficient liquidity pool that is not only serving its, uh, as an AMM where uh, you can exchange any token for the other, but at the same time, it's lending its assets outside of the protocol into some other yield generating strategy. So the first boosted pool is the Aave, uh, Balancer Aave boosted pool. And in that pool, you have DAI, USDC. I'm actually going to go back to that graphic. Um, somewhere around here, yeah. So you have USDT and AUSDT. AUSDT is the Aave wrapped version of USDT. So it has. So you can see here that there's a percentage of the assets in the pool. More of the 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 most of the USDT in this pool is actually deposited into Aave, and then the Aave A token is in this pool paired with USDT itself. This pool just needs to have enough USDT, USDC, and DAI to fulfill the demand from traders at any given moment. And the rest of the pool can be earning yield on Aave. So if you're a liquidity provider in this pool, you're earning from two different um, revenue streams. Uh, this is something very unique and innovative in DeFi that really isn't, I don't think is possible anywhere else other than on Balancer. So for an integrator, for a developer, um, boosted pools are interesting because they simplify the path for multi-pool operations. So you can keep everything within Balancer. And it also enables advanced applications. So out of two like weighted or metastable pools that contain, like for example, USD or Euro, you can create a whole Forex application that generates yield. And boosted pools, you know, this first one is, is built on Aave, but 
We have multiple new ones coming out soon with other partners um, that are utilizing assets in balancer pools within their protocols to do really interesting things. So a metastable pool is a, is a pool that is designed for tokens that uh, are highly correlated in value, but not uh, pegged exactly. So a great example of that is wrap staked ETH and ETH itself. Wrap staked ETH is, is uh, since it's staked, it's earning a yield, and it has a different value from ETH. It's always going to have a slightly different value from ETH. Um, but in a, this, what this is is a generalized stable pool that can hold pr these proportional assets. Um, and another example of that would be like DAI and CDAI. So you have a predictable schedule of like what the valuation uh, exchange rate is going to be between DAI and CDAI because you know how on compound the value of uh, de a deposited die is going to appreciate over time in order to um, account for the, the interest that it's going to earn. So let's, like, if we talk about Lido as an example, so um, when users stake ETH onto ETH 2.0 with, with Lido, they get staked ETH in return. And when they, and, through this pool, Lido makes it possible for anyone to get in and out of staked ETH very easily by just trading with a balancer pool instead of wrapping and unwrapping or staking and unstaking. So it's really the easiest way to do that. Um, last, lastly here in terms of pool types is something that we're currently developing right now that's coming out soon. It's called a managed pool. Managed pool is designed to um, optimize itself for sophisticated portfolio strategies and have more fine-grained control. One of the um, main products that you might build with a managed pool is an index fund. So a managed pool can hold up to 20 tokens, actually can hold more than 20 tokens. And uh, it you can set dynamic weights, you can set dynamic fees, and you have the ability to have an allow list of liquidity providers, or um, you have a manager of a pool who can implement a certain strategy for how that pool will invest its assets. Um, and you can change the tokens and the, and the allocations um, that that pool has uh, at any given time. Another thing about managed pools is that they have a feature called circuit breakers. So circuit breakers are designed to protect against like a black swan downside uh, event. So, uh, you know, DeFi kind of, it's in general doesn't really have that, but in traditional financial markets, when there's like a catastrophic crash, they have circuit breakers that can just kind of stop the markets from trading. So in a managed pool, a pool can at, uh, at any point decide that it needs to stop trading because, you know, let's say, for example, one of the tokens in that pool um, uh, got hacked. There was some kind of breach. There's some kind of um, market catastrophe, a rug pull, whatever might have happened. That pool can actually just stop trading so that the rest of the assets in the pool are protected. So you can also, not only can you use these, these really interesting pool configurations on Balancer, but you can also create your own custom uh, AMM pools. And I'll talk about a few examples um, of projects that have done this. So there's Elephant, Element Finance, uh, Sense Protocol, and Tempest Finance. These are three um, really cool projects that uh, use Balancer to create their own custom uh, AMM pools uh, to make fixed rate markets possible. Gyroscope uh, has built their, also their own AMM on Balancer, which serves to power um, a new stablecoin that they're releasing soon. Uh, and kind of the point here is not to dive into like all the complexity of how gyroscope works, but just to show that um, on Balancer, there's a lot of room for building custom solutions and um, kind of configuring things based on the needs of your application as a developer. Cron Finance and XS Finance are two separate projects that are using Balancer to build TWAMs, which is a time-weighted average market maker. Um, and the point of, of this product, um, it's kind of something that has been discussed 
in the space for a while, but no one really like built it and turned out that Balancer was the perfect place to do so. So uh, the goal of a, of a TWAM is to execute large trade orders over a, a longer period of time so that um, slippage remains low. You can take trades and you can break them up into smaller pieces. So the liquidity required for each of those trades to be executed uh, is less and the slippage is, is smaller. So this is really important for like large scale uh, investors or traders um, because in DeFi, like slippage is a huge issue when you're moving large amounts of capital. So um, th that's kind of a, a tour of some of the really interesting things that are being built on Balancer. Now I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the grants and perks that are available um, to developer teams. So these are a bunch of, uh, actually some of the projects that I've already mentioned today, as you can see, these are recipients of grants. They've received grants from Balancer to build what they were building and um, you know, ended up building something really amazing. So for any developers that are building in DeFi and, and need some kind of AMM functionality, um, if there's some kind of swap feature involved in your application, it's a lot better to use a ready-made solution that works, that's secure, and that's you know, battle-tested, uh, that you don't have to build from the ground up rather than kind of doing all that yourself. So um, highly recommend checking out um, our docs and um, definitely apply for a grant if that's something that's, that you want to do. We also have uh, this really cool partnership with Sertora, the guys who are here and are going to be speaking after me, I believe, which is the um, Balancer Sertora uh, Security Accelerator. So um, for projects that are building on Balancer, uh, you get access to two weeks of manual code review by Sertora, which you know, these guys are awesome. Um, smart contract uh, security firm. Uh, and this is something that is, is valuable to like any developer in the space. And it's really hard to get audits when you're, especially when you're a small team in the space. So that's kind of what we wanted to do is make this more accessible. Um, so yeah, and through this program, you get the two weeks of manual code review, you get set up an introduction of, of the of Satora's formal verification prover, and you get uh, $10,000 uh, worth of credits for Sertora's uh, form, formal verification. Uh, you also get into, uh, assistance from the Balancer integrations team on uh, your code functionality on business logic. So it's really a good time to get involved. Um, I'm gonna quickly just talk a little bit about uh, the F SDK because it's been recently revamped um, and we've been getting really good feedback from developers on that. So Balancer JS is a JavaScript SDK that provides uh, commonly used utilities for interacting with Balancer v2. Uh, Balpy is um, these Python tools for interacting with Balancer v2 in Python. Uh, Balancer SOR, SOR stands for Smart Order Router. Uh, this is a JavaScript off-chain off linear optimization of routing orders across liquidity pools to get the best price execution. Um, and then we also have two really cool community-led SDKs um, that have been supported by the Balancer Grants program. Um, Delphi, which is in Delphirium, and uh, also Rust. Um, so as a, as this is an example um, of configuring the SDK to use uh, mainnet subgraph and contracts. So SDK examples and tests can be run against a local fork. It's easy to hack and experiment without using real funds. And um, the SDK uses this very easy interface, the SOR, to find best swaps um, like across all of the liquidity on Balancer, which is around a billion dollars. And using the SDK, you can um, very easily add liquidity to any pool, and you can fetch and pre-calculate pool data, um, which is especially useful for uh, front ends. And with that, um, we can end here. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take those. Thank you.
Are we doing Q&A? Okay, great. So this, yeah. so this might be uh, slightly vague, uh, and feel free to not answer this question. But uh, uh, when you spoke about uh, uh, there being a circuit breaker in in a managed pool, uh, I, I circuit breaker, yeah, circuit breaker in, in your managed pool context. Yeah. Uh, who who acts as the circuit breaker? Who has that authority? And the larger question, I guess, is... Uh, so, sorry, who has what? I couldn't hear you who, that well. Who acts as that circuit breaker? Is that, oh. again, a decentralized role? Or is that, like, one person or a group of a few people who act as circuit breakers and decide that it's time to shut down the market for the time being? And uh, I, I guess the broader question is, uh, where do you draw the line? Uh, in the beginning, you stressed about uh, the importance of decentralization in finance. But uh, uh, we know that it's not a very practical thing. Somewhere we need to have some uh, some amount of centralization to get get it to work uh, properly. So where do you draw the line? If 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 you can articulate a clear question, a clear answer to such a vague question, I'd be good to hear. Sure. So I think the second part of your question, to make sure I, I understand, because the the audio is a little tricky, uh, was that you you're saying that. Um, while decentralization is great, like we still need some centralization as well. Um, I agree. I think I think decentralization, depending on it, it's very case specific for each project, like when it makes sense to be a hundred percent fully decentralized. But I think that when you look at the DeFi protocols, like the exchanges and the borrowing and lending protocols that have been operating very smoothly throughout all of the insane catastrophes that have happened in the crypto space the last couple of months, whilst, whilst you've seen a whole list of centralized platforms blow up and lose billions of dollars, I think it's a strong indication that um, this, the security and, uh, I mean, the transparency and the uh, verifiability of a decentralized system uh, is very superior to uh, a centralized system. It doesn't mean that, like, there can't be any centralized components like it depends on on the on the project and the system that you know I don't want to give a one size fits all prescription here but to me it's very clear that like defi will eat cfi uh cfi i mean it's these are the same issues that have uh, gone on for so long in the financial industry where there are you know risky lending decisions made or or like unethical decisions with customer funds as what's been alleged in the case of FTX. Like, these are things that are not possible in an immutable decentralized uh, protocol. Um, I think that with something as um, crucial as finance, we, we really need to transition. And I think that we are eventually going to transition from these um, human-led uh, systems where there's uh, a lot of room for either error or greed or you know, bad decisions or mis misuse of trust into systems that are fully open, fully transparent. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just very clear to me that that's what we need in finance. Um, and we don't need to have these billion dollar sort of catastrophes in the future. Um, I, I can talk a little bit about the managed pool circuit breakers. Again, these are like currently in development. So whatever we might talk about today can still kind of evolve and change and, and it's, it's not a final product right now. Um, but what I can say is that um, the idea is to set some like programmatic guardrails to defend or to protect the pool against like a, 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 like a catastrophic situation. So for example, if you had a liquidity pool that contained um, Terra USD, and uh, let's say you had Terra USD and you had like a few other stable coins that were all in this pool. And then Terra USD um, explodes, the price is suddenly dropping. What would normally happen in an AMM is that the AMM is programmed that when one token goes down, it sells the other tokens and buys more of that token that went, that, that went down, right? So in that scenario, the, every dollar in that pool would be lost. If you have a circuit breaker in place, you can stop that from happening at some threshold that is like defined by the creator of the pool so that in you know, a black swan event, 
you can actually protect uh, liquidity providers as much as possible. Yeah, I, uh, I get the reason for Right. Yes, it can be designed that way. Um, again, it's, it's a work in progress. So um, I just wanted to give you a preview of the product. It's, when it's done, I'll definitely have a lot more to share. So um, we, we talked about the problems in uh, centralized exchanges. Uh, we started seeing problems in the DeFi space also in, de in decentralized exchanges. Uh, two days ago, Anchor's uh, tokens was exploited. And they went to bank swipe and millions of dollars was uh, drained. Uh, do you have those kind of uh, uh, safeguards in the balancer? So I, I couldn't hear everything you said, but I think you were talking Can about. Um, yeah, a, Anchor was exploited uh, right, on right. December 1, yeah. uh, December 1st. Uh, and, then, and then the fund was moved to bank swipe once again, uh, DeFi mm -hmm. uh, DEX, and, and then it's drained from there. Yeah, so uh, there's always a risk like in, a, in an AMM that if a token that is held in a liquidity pool gets exploited, that you know, any liquidity provider that is in that pool, even, even the one that is providing the token that is kind of trading against that, that token that got exploited, can lose their funds. So um, smart contract risks is very real. We need teams like Sertora to... Um, you know, help keep the keep the space safe uh, as much as possible from those risks. Those are um, those are very real. Um, so, I think DeFi has its risks uh, that are different from the ones in CFI, right? So, in in DeFi, we have more security risk in terms of like code exploits. Um, in CFI, we have more like human risk, where you have a trusted person who's in charge of potentially billions of dollars in funds that, that belong to their customers. And we have to trust them to be ethical and moral and fair and on honest. And like so many times in the past and just, just recently, that has not worked out well. So um, what I'm advocating for is uh, trusting more in like secure code than in like an individual or even like a charismatic person who, who seems very trustworthy. It looks, uh, logic, you know, it looks logical that uh, code will be a bit secure, but it also gives uh, opportunity to hackers and everybody else who understand that everybody can go and exploit. Okay, uh, in, the, in the previous case, it's like a one person which is not able to do good and we all get suffered because of that. But here, uh, the information is available publicly. Okay, the kind of exploit happened with Anchor, uh, anybody can do who understand better for Web3. So yes, we can say that we are shifting our security uh, measures from, from direction A to direction B, but it's still saying that, okay, DeFi is the better or more secure than CFI seems to be subjective. Yeah, and I would also just mention like in the case of the Anchor exploit, so Anchor got exploited, but the AMM a pancake swap was not exploited, right? So, but the people who provided liquidity in Anchor on PancakeSwap lost their money. So I think in DeFi, there are kind of multi-dimensional risks that an investor has to consider. So the investor that bought the Anchor token and put it in and, and decided to be a liquidity provider on AMM uh, took a risk in the security of that protocol, and unfortunately, that didn't work out. And like, I'm not, I don't have anything negative to say about Anchor at all. I, that's not my point. Um, my point is, even if a platform is fully is, is is very secure and not exploited, the assets from all or over DeFi that can be held on that platform all have their own risks as well. So there's like really an exponential um, matrix of risks. Um, that most people, I think that you would agree, most people who are using these technologies don't fully understand all of those risks. Either they, either they know that it's risky and they're, they're doing it and they're taking the risk, like some people like to gamble, but I think a lot of people are not fully aware of those risks. Um, and in a decentralized ecosystem, it's really hard to 
provide good protection against those risks because there is no one there really like holding your hand or like stopping you from buying something because it's not safe. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's very tricky. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, and uh, appreciate all your questions. <laughs>